Welcome back. I'm Father Barnabas Powell of St. Raphael Nicholas and Irene Greek Orthodox Church in Cumming, Georgia. And this coming Sunday's homily that we're going to be in, hopefully enjoying here in just a bit is the story in the Gospels about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, there are several things that I want you to notice about this very powerful Gospel lesson. We'll get into that during the homily, but first... I want to thank all of you for your kind notes and your emails that you've been sending. Right now, we have already 5,000 people watching each week to the, uh, to the videos that we're putting up. We're pretty excited about that, and we're thanking God for it. We're asking you to continue to share these videos with your friends if you find them valuable, and let them know that this is a way for you to encourage yourself during the week to stay focused on God. The key to spiritual maturity is learning how to remember God moment by moment in your life. And I uh, hope that this homily this morning is going to help us do exactly that. We're going to discover that the spiritual hunger of our lives can be fed, but it is going to be us feeding one another with the food that Jesus blesses. I'll be right back in just a bit, right after the homily. God bless you. When the Model T or the car was invented in the United States, it didn't go very fast. 10, 15 miles an hour. By the way, before I get too terribly far into this, wasn't the lady singing lovely this morning? Wasn't that nice? That was really cool. These are young people from our summer camp who wanted to, uh, to help chant in the service this morning. Isn't that wonderful? I want to encourage our young people to do that. That is the path to life. God bless you, ladies, and thank you so very much. Now all we have to do is recruit some fellows. But when the car was invented, it didn't go very fast, 10, 15 miles an hour. And as the, this horseless carriage thing caught on, they wondered, well, maybe we could get it to go a little faster and maybe shorten our trips. That'd be great. And the scientist of the day said, oh no, at 30 miles an hour, human blood begins to boil. It's impossible for a car to go over 30 miles an hour. If a car goes over 30 miles an hour, the occupants will be killed because their blood will begin to boil in their body. It's impossible. Guess what they found? It's not impossible. The word impossible has been tossed around so many times throughout the centuries, it's absolutely become almost anach anachronistic. It's almost silly to even use the word now. It's impossible for men to fly. They flew. It's impossible for men to go to the moon. They went to the moon. It's impossible for men to go to Mars. Wait just a little bit. The word impossible has been used over and over and over again, and... Each time, human ingenuity, by the grace of God, each time human uh, information has succeeded to go beyond the barriers that people set. It's impossible to break the sound barrier. The sound barrier was broke. Imagine what will be impossible tomorrow. As we think about the word impossible, I want to bring this down to our own lives as well because the fact of the matter is, in your life and in my life, We've used the word impossible about some things in our own lives. I'll never be happy. I'll never break out of this bad situation. It's impossible for me to get better. It's impossible for me to improve. It's just not possible for me to break this habit. It's impossible for me to lose weight. It turns out it's not. It's impossible. Although I do look forward to the day that science finally gets to the point where you can eat a cheesecake and not gain a pound. I, that's, that's, I pray that's not impossible. That, that would be lovely. But the fact of the matter is, in my own life, I have run up against that word impossible. In our own community here, brothers and sisters, we are facing what looks Impossible. If you go out into the narthex and look at that beautiful drawing that our architect has drawn, you will see something that is 
impossible to our thinking now. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, Father, that's very ambitious. Do you really think in this economy that this is possible? And to be fair, dear ones, I think it's extremely important for us to live in reality. One of the things that I fell in love with about orthodoxy was that orthodoxy demands that I deal with reality. I don't deal with the fantasy world of it's great or it's horrible. Those two fantasy worlds will always lead us astray. Elation and despondency will lie to us, dear ones. I want to say that, say that again. Elation and despondency will always lie to us. Always. Always, it's never as great as we imagine we're at the, when we're at the top of the roller coaster. And it's never as bad as when we're down at the valley. It's never, it's just, both of those places are illusions. Hence the reason why the fathers of the church constantly edged us on and urged us on and encouraged us to seek nepsis, sober joy, and even keel. The good times don't carry us too high. The bad times don't carry us too low. Oh, Father, you don't understand. In my busy life, with my bills, with my problems in my life, that's impossible. You just don't understand the problems that I'm going, to, going through, Father. You don't understand the bills that I have. You don't understand the debt that I'm under. You don't understand how hard it is at my job. You don't understand how difficult it is with my husband or my wife or my children. You don't understand my problems. Well, I think if you sit with me for a little while, you'll find out that um, I get it. I understand what you're going through. But this has been the common life of humans since the beginning. Difficulties in life are normal. That's why I always get amazed when somebody comes and talks to me and says, Father, if I can just get beyond this hump in my life, then I'll be happy. Wait a second. <laughs> After this hump comes another hump. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a humpy life. <laughs> so if I try to live in the fantasy of, well, if I can just get beyond this set of problems, then everything's going to be fine. If I live in that, I will live with a constant disappointment of reality. It will be impossible for me to reach sober joy. But in our gospel lesson today, our Lord Jesus gives us and confronts his disciples with something that is impossible. And it's, it's, it's striking to me, and those of you who have ears to hear, those of you who can hear this, it's striking to me that it is this, that you, the Lord uses this story to deal with this situation. Look at, what he do, what, look at what he uses. He uses hunger and food to deal with the impossible. I want you to notice that. Pay attention to that, folks. That's significant. Why do you think the center of our Orthodox life is the Eucharistic life of the church? The Eucharistic life of the church, eating bread and drinking wine, is the center of the development of our spirituality to become a mature and grown-up Christian. Orthodox on purpose. It is not a mistake. There is great wisdom if those of us who have ears to hear, those of you who have the courage to open your hearts and your minds to begin to appreciate and develop and to discern and to contemplate the glorious beauty of the faith that you have. You will uncover treasures that will inform every aspect of your life, every decision that you make, and every priority that you set for your life in this gloriously rich, beautiful, all-encompassing, full, magnanimous, and wonderful Greek Orthodox faith. It's all here. It's all here. Every answer to every problem you could ever have, right here. Oh, but Father, you don't understand. I don't know how to do my taxes. Trust me, I know. Connie, say nothing. <laughs> But there's an answer for that in our faith. So Jesus confronts the disciples with the impossible. Let me set it up for you. Jesus' popularity at this point in his ministry has become over the top. 
Folks have found out that if you go see this man, you'll get better. Your boils will go away, your backache will go away, your headache will go away, your toenails won't hurt no more. All you got to do is see this guy. He's the one. Well, that'll make you popular anywhere you go. You start emptying out hospitals and some folks, everybody wants to be around you. So Jesus Christ has become very popular. He is traveling around and he's speaking throughout Israel, preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what Jesus preached, by the way. You know that, don't you? The kingdom of God is at hand. The rule of God, the new society that operates on the principles of the heavenly eternal kingdom is now on top of us and it's available to everyone if they just have the courage to step into it. That's the message of Jesus. Jesus offers this message to everyone and he's very popular. He goes into this area, huge crowd, 5,000 men, by the way, not counting women and children. Did you notice that? So... A low estimate of the crowd that's in this field is between 12 and 15,000 people, okay? That's pretty good Sunday morning attendance. Give me a few years. No, no, God forbid. God save us. The fact of the matter is, this huge crowd is going out into a field. Now, this is a normal thing that most teachers of the day do because the acoustics are better in the area, and plus, that amount of people in small villages will ruin the village. It's just too big for the villages to handle. So most great speakers of the day would carry them to a field where the acoustics were good and the people could sit down and they wouldn't ruin the towns. So it makes perfect sense. All of this is very practical and very, very uh, open and, and it's, it's, there's no mystery to it. So Jesus is there and he's teaching the crowd. It lasts all day long and it gets to be towards night. The disciples come with a very reasonable comment. This is completely understandable. Folks, This don't give the disciples a hard time. Jesus is going to use this to teach us some valuable lessons. Are you ready? The disciples say, Lord, it's late. These folks are hungry. Let them go into the surrounding villages and get food. Perfectly reasonable. Jesus then confronts the disciples with the impossible. There is no need for them to leave, Jesus tells the disciples. You feed them. Lord, all we have are five loaves and two fishes. Now, even if they were big loaves and really large fish, this is not, the disciples were saying, Master, you don't understand. What we have is inadequate to the need. We only have five loaves and two fish. What we have, what we can see with our eyes, what we can assess in the situation that exists as it stands right now, not trying to con anybody, not trying to play it down, what we see when we match with our resources to our need, it's impossible. Jesus says, bring what you have to me. Then Jesus blesses it, breaks it, and gives it out to the people. He has them sit down in the field, and he feeds them. At the end of everybody getting enough to satisfy everybody, all the twelve to 15,000 folks, they take up 12 baskets full of leftovers so that the resources they had before the Lord blessed and broke it and gave it to the people were, were smaller than the resources they left with after everyone had been satisfied. I don't know about you. That qualifies as a miracle. I don't care who you are, that's a miracle. So what is the Lord trying to show us in this story? Brothers and sisters, the Lord is trying to show us in your difficulties in your own life, in your challenges in your own life, in the fears of your own life, in the places in your life where you're stuck, in the places in your life where you are not growing and spiritually maturing, in the places in your life where you have hit a rut, in your relationships, with your children, in your business, in your career, in every place, those moments in our lives 
can con us into believing it's impossible. It's not true. What is the path out of the impossible situation? It is first the courage to admit what you have isn't adequate to to your need. Can you say that? What you have is not adequate to meet your need. If I look at my need and I look at what I have, I don't have the tools, I'm not able. This is what I've got and this is all I've got and it's not enough. Anybody who's ever tried to pay bills at the end of the month knows exactly what that feels like. Secondly, after the courage to admit that you don't have enough, that you're not able to get beyond this hump in your life, That is the first step to true repentance, dear ones, an honest assessment of who and where you are. Secondly, bring what you have to the Lord. Bring what you have to the Lord. Lord, it's not enough. This is all we've got. The Lord says, fine. Because, dear ones, I promise you, if you're humble enough, if you're courageous enough, if you're brave enough, to humble yourself and finally let let aside this foolish notion that I can somehow live my life by myself, that I can somehow pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I don't need anything. If I can humbly build into my life the humility to constantly bring, bring myself to Jesus Christ and offer Him what I have, not what I don't have. Everybody's constantly thinking about what they don't have. They're constantly comparing themselves to others who look like they have more. What a poverty. What a waste of time. It never produces good fruit. All it produces is envy and depression. Who wants to be envy and depressed all the time? Not me. So, instead of focusing on what we don't have, we are challenged by this message gospel lesson to focus on what we do have and have the courage to bring what we do have to God. I don't have all the answers, Lord. I don't know the path. But here's what I've got. Take it. And guess what God does? Every time. God takes the offering that you make in love. God takes the offering that you make in, from your own poverty many times. From your own weaknesses. God, I don't know what else to do. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't have to get to the end of our rope before we finally turn to God in prayer? Wouldn't that be lovely? (laughs) Wouldn't it be wonderful if we built into our lives the natural first step is to go to God, not wait till we're in desperate situations before we finally seek Him. We bring to God what we have, God takes it, and He blesses it and breaks it and gives it out. And guess what happens? After everyone around you has been taken care of, you find out that your resources are 12 times bigger than what you thought you had. Father, are you talking about money? Why in heaven's name would I reduce this just to cash? No, I'm talking about the spiritual bounty of your own soul. Does it show up in financial blessings? Why does that even matter? The very fact that we would even be focused on that would be missing the point. The true point is to develop your spiritual life so that your soul prospers even as your body prospers. So that your spiritual life is as robust as your physical life. So that your spiritual life is cared for like you care for your home. Like you care for your family. Like you care for your children. Like you care for your finances. So that your spiritual life takes on the proper priority in your own life so that you have the courage to offer to God what you possess, regardless of what that is. And God then blesses it and breaks it, and He makes the impossible possible. This morning, you may be confronted with impossible things in your life. You may be going through a difficult time in your marriage. You may be having a hard time raising your children. Financially, you may be scared and nervous. I understand that. As a community, we look at that plat drawn in the back and we think, how can we few do this great thing? Honestly, we can't. 
But guess who can? Brothers and sisters, now is the time for the courageous men and women to give to God what they have and watch God bless it and give it back to us. Twelve times larger than we thought. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry. You can be at peace in your life. If you'll just banish the word. Impossible. So, are you ready to be fed? Are you ready to bring to the Lord what you have? Not focusing on what you don't have. That is not the path to freedom. That is not the path to hope. That is not the path to a joyous and growing and spiritually maturing Christian life. We don't focus on what we don't have. We focus on what we do have. And then we present what we have to the Lord. God takes what, he, what we bring Him. He blesses it. And then we discover that with his blessings, we had more than enough to take care of every need we could possibly have. Somebody asked me, they said, Father, is this about money? Oh, goodness, I would never want to reduce this beautiful spiritual treasure to just financial blessings. But dear ones, the fact of the matter is, is that this wise principle of bringing to the Lord what you have, not focusing on what you don't have, not focusing on the impossible, because the impossible is always going to be impossible if you believe it's impossible. No, no, no. We focus on what we have regardless of what it is. And that it certainly includes our financial blessings. All the stuff that we have in our lives. The challenge is, are our priorities exactly where we should be so that we have in our hearts what we need? what we really need most of all. So, I'm, thank, I'm thankful that you were here this week. I pray, I pray that the uh, sermon was a blessing to you. I invite you to come to church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We have divine liturgy here at Saints Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene Greek Orthodox Church. And also on Wednesday evenings, we have Vespers, as well as Great Vespers on Saturday nights here at the parish, along with opportunities for confession. Please drop me a line. Um, I'm always tempted to use that old phrase from uh, radio and television, keep those cards and letters coming in. <laughs> well, we do enjoy hearing from you, and if it is a blessing to you, we certainly want to know about it. And if you have words of encouragement, we'd love to hear those as well. Exciting things happening here at Saints Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene, a parish that is geared with ministries for the entire family. Sunday school is getting underway. We have Sunday school programs. We have all kinds of exciting things going on, youth programs, and a wonderful developing thing that is going on here at the community with our young people. Come and see. You're invited. We'd love to see you. God bless you. Until next time, may the Lord watch between us while we are apart from one another.